to this sub video which is part of a four part production for the clinical anatomy of back pain lecture aims to review the normal anatomy of the spine which is all encompassing of the osteology, arthrology of the vertebral column and supportive structures such as ligaments. So the adult vertebral column usually consists of 33 vertebral segments. Each presacral segment so except for the first two cervicals, so C1 and 2, is separated from its neighbour by a fibrocartilaginous intervertebral disc. The collective functions of the column are to support the trunk, to protect the spinal cord and nerves, and to provide attachments for muscles. Its total length in males is around 70 centimetres and about 60 centimetres in females. Approximately 8% of overall body length is accounted for by the cervical spine, 20% by the thoracic spine, and 12% by the lumbar spine. In addition, 8% is accounted for by the sacrococcygeal regions. Although the number of vertebrae is 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, and 4 coccygeal, this total is subject to frequent variability. If we look at the typical curvature development, the spine is divided up into four main curves and this allows for different movements. So as you'll notice in a normal adult spine we have this classic S shape and it is thought to be that this arrangement or shape is in order to maximize the amount of compression that the spine can withstand. So in, if we look at a neonate, the vertebral column is particularly flexible. So if we look at this picture of an infant over here, if we had to dissect the vertebrae or spine out of the body, it can be bent, flexed and extended into a perfect half circle. If we look at the curves, the curves can be divided up into primary or secondary curves. So the primary curves are those that are fixed or developed at birth, and this includes the thoracic and the sacral curves. So the thoracic curve is actually the first to develop or attain maturation. And then the secondary curves are those that attain shape with locomotion. And this is usually going to correspond to major growth milestones, such as a infant being able to hold its head, crawl and walk. So for instance, a baby can hold the weight of their head at around three to four months. They can sit upright at around nine months of age and typically will commence walking between 12 and 15 months. So these functional changes then exert major influence on the development of the secondary curvatures of the vertebral column, as well as changes in the proportional size of the vertebrae, so in particular in the lumbar region. So the secondary lumbar curvature becomes very important when maintaining the centre of gravity of the trunk over the legs as walking begins. So if we then look at the typical adult spine, we can see that the cervical spine is convex anteriorly, so it's going to protrude anteriorly, and this natural state or curvature is referred to as a lordotic curve, or we say it's lordosis. And this is going to be the least marked of the four regions. The thoracic curve, on the other hand, is convex posteriorly, so it's going to protrude posteriorly, and this is going to be consistent with kyphosis. So this is caused by the increased posterior height of the thoracic vertebral bodies. The lumbar curve is convex anteriorly too, so such as the cervical spine, so this is going to be lordotic. And then the pelvic curvature is concave anteroinferiorly and involves the sacrum and the coccygeal vertebrae. So this is going to extend from the lumbar sacral junction to the apex of the coccyx. So the lumbar spine is held in lordosis. So the degree of this lordosis is determined by the lumbar sacral angle, which is usually between 30 to 45 degrees. And the muscles responsible for this posture include your erector spina, your rectus abdominis, internal and external obliques, and so is major, just to name a few. This lordosis can be increased as a result of weak abdominal muscles and tight hamstring muscles. It can be decreased or flattened commonly in, pe in people with either acute or chronic back pain, or can be reversed as well. So if we look at the common deviations, we can see in, a, in this patient where we have um, pronounced or exaggerated lordosis, we have an abnormal curvature in the lumbar region, and this is going to result in this classic sway back deformity. Kyphosis 
usually refers to abnormal curvature in the thoracic region, so responsible for this hunchback deformity. And then a common postural deviation seen throughout the spine is scoliosis or lateral curvature of the spine. So this can be structural, compensatory or protective. In structural scoliosis, the lateral curvature is associated with vertebral rotation and both the curve and rotation become more accentuated on forward flexion. So such a scoliosis is common in adolescent girls and its cause is unknown. Um, it may also be secondary to an underlying disorder such as muscular dystrophy or spina bifida. So if we look at the general features of a typical vertebrae, so in this case we're looking at a lumbar vertebrae, it can be divided into anterior and posterior regions. So the anterior division consists of this large vertebral body which is going to bear most of the compressive forces. Um, that are distributed down onto the spine. And then posteriorly, we have what's called the neural arch. So the neural arch is composed of pedicles, which are going to attach the arch to the vertebral body. We have the lamina, which constitute the roof of the arch. And this is going to join the pedicles in the midline to the posterior spinous process, which is going to be the bony protuberances that you can palpate on your own backs. The transverse processes are going to project posteriorly and laterally. Um, and then we also have the superior and inferior articular facets. And then lastly, coursing medially and in the center um, of the neural arch, we have the vertebral foramen, which is going to form this protective hole for the spinal cords um, meninges and associated vessels. So if we look at some of the abnormalities then associated with the vertebral body, in the CT scan besides, so we're looking at a parasagittal view, we can see compression or a decrease in the height of the vertebral body over here. So this is going to be consistent with a compression fracture and usually a compression fracture is going to be most common when you're looking at um, an osteoporotic spine. So when you have a decrease in the bone density of the vertebral body, um, this is going to make it more prone to fractures um, because it is weakened. So the image above with Radiopedia demonstrates a comparison between what the normal vertebral body should look like with respect to height and width. Um, we also compare and contrast to an acute, which is called an anterior step defect. And then we have an old um, vertebral body. And clearly we can see a decrease in the, the vertebral height. So when we're looking at the radiological features, a loss in height in the anterior, middle and posterior dimension that um, often exceeds 20% is going to be consistent with such degenerative changes. Um, and this can typically be classified into three main criteria with severe constituting more than 40% loss of height of the vertebral body. In addition, the vertebral body can be subject to osteoarthritis. So with osteoarthritis, a common manifestation is the production of osteophytes which is going to be bony protuberances or bone spurs or outgrowths from a particular region of bone. So if we're looking specifically then at the vertebral body on this CT scan again, we can see that we have this anterior bony spurs associated with the cervical spine. And this can also be a major cause of back pain depending on where the osteophytes are located. So we can see in this first image that if the bone spur is impinging on a nerve root, typically this is then going to be associated with radiating pain, for instance. And then we can also have um, foraminal narrowing if you have osteophytes growing immediately posteriorly in the midline of the vertebral body. Um, so just reiterating that it's actually the dorsal rami of the spinal nerves as well as the recurrent meningeal nerves of the spinal nerves that are going to supply the bones as well as the dura as well as the annulus fibrosis. And then specifically the dorsal rami are also going to innervate the back muscles which we will discuss in the following lecture. We're looking at the cervical vertebrae specifically. We have seven cervical vertebrae. They are going to be the smallest of all of the vertebrae and a unique feature 
is this hole that is running laterally to the vertebral body. So this is called the transverse foramen or foramina if you have multiple. And the significance of this is that the vertebral arteries are actually going to course through the transverse foramen to reach the brain, so to supply the, and the posterior circulation of the brain. So the main range of motion of the cervical spine is going to be flexion, extension, lateral flexion and rotation. So if you flex your cervical spine, this is going to be a classic touching your chin to your, to your chest. Extension is looking up at the ceiling. Lateral flexion is touching your ear to your shoulder. And then rotation, so if you're turning your head from side to side, so shaking your head in, as if you were saying no, for instance. This would be classic cervical rotation. So the main function of the cervical vertebrae is to support the weight of the head. It's to respond to muscle forces and to provide mobility. If we look at the general features of a cervical vertebrae, we have a very small vertebral body. We have these unique transverse foramen that we spoke about. Posterior spinous process is usually characterized as a short and bifid spinous process so this means you have this fork-like division and we have a large fairly triangular invertebral body. The two exceptions of this morphology are going to be the cervical vertebrae 1 and 2 so otherwise called the atlas and axis. So the atlas is the first cervical vertebrae and it functions to support the head. It is unique in that it fails to incorporate a centrum whose posi expected position is occupied by the dens, so in this space over here. And this is a cranial um, protuberance from the axis, as noted over here. So the dens, or otherwise known as the odontoid process. So the atlas then consists of two lateral masses. So notice that we don't actually have a vertebral body. And this is then connected to a short anterior and posterior arch. So these lateral masses are ovoid, so each is going to bear a kidney-shaped superior articular facet, and that is then going to articulate with the occipital condyles from the occipital bone of the skull. Um, the transverse processes are also going to be longer than a typical cervical vertebrae, except for the seventh, and these act as strong levers for muscles that help to make the fine adjustments to keep the head balanced. So the joint then formed between the atlas and the skull is called the atlanto-occipital joint, and it is responsible mainly for sagittal plane movements. So this is purely going to be flexion and extension of the head and neck. The atlas, on the other hand, is our second cervical vertebrae and it is going to act as an axle for rotation of the atlas and the head around the strong dens or odontoid process. So if we look at another example of a fracture, so what we're looking at here, and although it's a little bit tricky to see, is a fracture then of the pars interarticularis of the axis or C2 and this is classically denoted as a hangman fracture. So it is caused by post-traumatic neck pain after a high-velocity hyperextension injury that is associated with hangings. Um, and also you can mimic this mechanism of injury in um, high-speed car accidents. And if we have a look from an axial view, we can clearly see that we have our transverse foramen here, our vertebral body, and then we have these two bilateral fractures um, at the pars intraarticularis. So moving on to the thoracic vertebrae, there are 12 vertebrae that constitute or make up the thoracic spine, and this is going to be located in the chest or the upper back. So when we think thoracic, we think thorax, so very much that region where the heart and the lungs are located. So most movement of the thoracic spine is going to be restricted. So we have a small range of motion for flexion extension, lateral flexion and rotation, However, there is no primary movement of the thoracic spine. The main reason for this is each vertebrae are going to contain or display lateral costal facets, which as the name implies, articulates with the ribs. So due to the articulation with the ribs, we want to create this really nice, sturdy, protective thoracic cage 
and accordingly we don't want it to be able to move. So in comparison to the cervical vertebrae, the apophysial joints between adjacent thoracic vertebrae, so when we're referring to the apophysial joints, it is going to be these joints between the inferior articular facets and the superior articular facets of adjacent vertebrae, they're going to be orientated in a more vertical plane as opposed to the cervical vertebrae. The general features then of the thoracic vertebrae, again, we're going to have um, a vertebral body, which is going to be classically heart-shaped. We have superior and inferior articular facets or processes, which are going to be more vertically projected. The spinous process is going to be slanted or angled inferiorly. And then we have these large transverse processes which have costal facets um, attached to both them as well as the vertebral bodies to allow for that articulation with the ribs. The lumbar vertebrae on the other hand are going to be drastically larger. They're going to be heavier um, and they are going to be most the most highly loaded structure in the skeletal system. Just, and this is just going to be because of the amount of weight that is bared onto these vertebrae. As a result, they are going to be large. They're going to have wider bodies from side to side than anterior to posterior. The pedicles are going to be relatively short. The spinous processes are going to be really big and chunky. To accommodate for this, the intervertebral discs are going to be a lot thicker. And the typical range of motion for the lumbar spine in flexion and extension ranges up to 20 degrees at various levels. Um, we have a combined 60 degrees for flexion, 40 degrees for extension. We also have the capacity to laterally flex, so to move to the left side or the right side of the body. Um, as if you're stretching to approximately 25 degrees and then there's about 20 degrees of rotation. One of the most important joints that are going to be affiliated with the lumbar region is going to be the lumbar sacral joint which is the most mobile of the lumbar joints um, and this is going to account for the largest proportion of flexion and extension. So this is going to be that interface between L5 and the first sacral vertebrae. So these are just two revision questions for you to think about before coming to the practical session. Um, so we won't go through it today, but this is just going to be a series of checkpoints throughout the lecture to make sure that um, you are able to revise or summarize the key content presented. If we then move on to the arthrology or the joints that are located between the vertebrae, a typical vertebrae has six joints. So we have four plane synovial joints, so two above and two below, as denoted by the white circles or dashes. These are called our zygoapophysial joints. So the zygoapophysial joints are formed between the superior and the inferior articular facets um, between two adjacent vertebrae. Secondly, we also have two symphyses. So these are going to be in the form of the intervertebral discs as denoted by the pink lines. And again, we have one above and one below. So if we then look at the relationship between the structure or the angle of the zygophysial joint and the movement that it permits, we can see that in the cervical region, so when we're looking at the C-spine, the zygophysial joints are slanted at a 45 degree angle. So this means that based on this particular structure or um, arrangement, it is going to be optimal to allow for flexion and extension of the individual vertebrae and collectively the C-spine. So ideally through flexion and extension in both this anterior and posterior direction, it means that the vertebral bodies as well as the spinous processes have enough room to adequately move back and forth. If we then consider the zygopophysial arrangement in the thoracic spine, we can see that these are going to be more vertically orientated. So these are almost at a 60 degree angle and accordingly it's going to result in very limited movement. So this is why flexion and extension are not going to be a primary mover, but there's going to be a little bit of plane um, or non-axial movement located in this region or located between the zygoapophysial joints. And then lastly, in the lumbar region, we can see that looking at this posterior view, the apophysial joints are going to be curved. So we can see the superior articular process is 
positioned almost medially compared to the inferior articular process is going to be more laterally orientated. Again, allowing for flexion and extension of the lumbar spine. If we then move on and have a look at the contents of the vertebral canal, because this is relatively important when we're considering the neurological basis or neurological implications with respect to compression or inflammation of nerve structures, it is important to have an understanding of what is actually running through the vertebral canal. I'm sure that this has been covered in your neuroanatomy lecture so far, but just to reiterate, the spinal cord lies within the bony canal, which is formed by the vertebral body as well as the neural arch posteriorly. So the anterior wall is going to be formed by the vertebrae as well as the posterior um, longitudinal ligament. We also have the vertebral disc which is going to be located anteriorly. We can see also in this space, so we have the spinal cord which is going to be the most central structure. We have these glad wrap layers then surrounding the spinal cord which are the meninges. So there are three meninges called the pia mater which directly attaches to the spinal cord followed by the arachnoid mater and the dura mater which is going to be the tough outer layer. We can see that we have the spinal nerves which are going to be protruding out of the spinal cord. So we're passing through this intervertebral foramen or canal and we can see the rami clearly protruding. So when we're talking about a spinal nerve, the spinal nerve is going to be post or distal to the ganglion and then this is going to actually split into an anterior ramus and a posterior ramus as we can see over here. So the anterior ramus is always going to be the thickest, the biggest, because it has um, more that it has to innovate. And in the lumbar spine particularly, this is going to form the lumbar sacral plexus, as opposed to the dorsal rami or the posterior rami, which only innervates the muscles of the back, um, as well as some of the structures of the vertebral column itself. And then lastly, well, everything needs a blood supply. So we have a vertebral venous plexus that runs within the epidural space, which is located just superficial to this dura mater, but also deep to a ligament right at the back, which lies adjacent to the spinous process, which is going to be the ligamentum flavum, which we'll go into in a little bit. So if we then consider associated pathology, we have spoken about the effects of osteoarthritis in terms of the osteophyte formation and osteo. Um, lipping, for instance, and we can see that as soon as we start having protuberances, especially on the lateral and posterior aspects of the vertebral body, it has the potential then to impede upon this vertebral canal. And that's when we're going to start to see ramifications with respect to compression and inflammation and irritation of whatever nerves um, are in the immediate vicinity. So then if we look at the spinal nerves a little bit more, so this is just going to be some basic revision. We have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. They are considered to be segmental and they're going to emerge from the vertebral canal between the pedicles of adjacent vertebrae. So essentially we're looking at this opening over here between adjacent vertebrae. So there are eight pairs of cervical nerves um, and this is important to note because they are going to emerge superior to the vertebrae. So for instance because we know we only have seven cervical vertebrae C7 will emerge superior to the C7 vertebral level, C8 is going to then be inferior, we'll then have T1 vertebrae and then um, everything from T1 down to the lumbar spine is going to emerge inferior to the vertebral bodies. So if we're looking at the pairs of cranial nerves, we have eight of them in the cervical spine. There are 12 in thoracic, five in both lumbar and sacral, and then in one in the coccygeal. So if we're looking at the basic formation, as I alluded to before, starting from posterior, we have our neural arch. So we have spinous process, the lamina and then we'll give rise to the transverse processes depending where we are. We then have the epidural space which is going to be this cushion buffer immediately posteriorly and anterior within the vertebral canal but to the spinal cord. We can then see in terms of these glad wrappy layers we have the dura mater and arachnoid mater which are going to be continuous with one another. Just deep to that we have the subarachnoid space which is where cerebral spinal fluid is going to circulate 
And then attached directly to the spinal cord, we have these rootlets. So we can see posteriorly, we have the dorsal rootlets, we have ventral rootlets. They come together to form a spinal nerve. At this point, we then have the mixing or interaction between motor and sensory fibers. And then this gives rise to the anterior or ventral rami and dorsal rami. We can also see that stemming from the ventral rami, we do have sympathetic ganglia too that are running lateral to the vertebral body. So as we mentioned before, the ventral rami innervate most of the skeletal muscles, the trunk, the limb, and then remaining areas of skin except for the head, whereas the dorsal rami are only going to innervate your intrinsic, so those deep back muscles, and then another strip of skin located in the back. So if we look then at the intervertebral foramina, so this hole or protuberance coming out of adjacent vertebrae, we can see that each spinal nerve is going to exit via this bony opening and then it's going to split into the ventral and also rami. So what is of significance when we're looking at pathology and or common presentations associated with back pain is looking at particular conditions. The first, which is going to be spondylolysis, which refers to a discontinuity or a fracture in a region known as the pars interarticularis, which is going to be this articular pillar formed by um, the two articular facets. And this essentially is going to be the weakest point of the bone and most susceptible to fractures. So the etiology is uncertain, but it is related to chronic microtrauma um, and it leads to a stress type reaction or fracture, particularly in the lumbar spine. This condition or fractures are usually bilateral. So as we mentioned, it occurs in the lumbar spine, but usually at that L5 S1 junction. So usually associated with the pars articularis of L5. Spondylolysis can occur in cervical and thoracic spine, but it is very rare and it is most commonly related to a developmental abnormality as opposed to trauma. Another term that you may come across is spondylolisthesis, which is referring to when you have a fracture of the pars articularis due to axial loading and the incompetent pars, so not being able to withstand or bear weight, it can result in slippage of the vertebrae. So typically we see an elongation of the spinal canal in an AP direction and we tend to see anterior translation of the vertebrae, particularly in the lumbar spine, due to this fracture. This in turn is going to result in foraminal stenosis and accordingly nerve root compression, which can be then responsible for any presenting back pain. If we then move on to the intervertebral disc, which is located between the articular cartilage of adjacent vertebral bodies, the collective function is to help to resist or absorb the compression in all directions. So if we're looking at the general formation of the intervertebral disc, we can see that we have these cartilaginous fibrocartilage rings on the periphery, which are termed the annulus fibrosis. And then in the middle, we have this gelatin or toothpaste-like structure, which is a gelatinous core, which is called the nucleus pulposus. So if we look at the composition of this, the water content within the nucleus pulposus is extremely high, particularly in young adults. So in your 20s, it's comprised mostly, so about 90% of water. The functions to help with compressive loading. Um, so the fluid pressure in the nucleus pulposus is going to eventually press onto um, the adjacent vertebral bodies, but in a relatively even manner. So it helps to distribute a lot of the force and the load. The annulus in order of function is going to resist radial expansion. So it's going to help to maintain the integrity of the structure, but it can deform in spinal bending. So then when we increase in age, eventually we start losing water content of the nucleus pulposus. So the intervertebral disc is going to dehydrate and accordingly we're going to lose the height of the intervertebral disc. So this is going to be relatively common in older 
individuals when you're looking at an MRI, for example. So if we then consider what happens when you slip a disc or you have a herniated or prolapsed disc, this is usually referring to when you have excessive micro tearing in the annulus fibrosus, our toothpaste-like substance in the center is eventually going to protrude posteriorly because this is going to be the only direction it can possibly move due to the presence of a relatively weak ligament called the posterior longitudinal ligament. Posterior longitudinal ligament only runs in the midline of the posterior vertebrae. So you have these openings or deficiencies on the lateral aspects, which is going to be the perfect environment for the substance to actually leak out. So when we're looking at disc degeneration and accordingly prolapse, we can see that as the nucleus pulposus is herniating, it can add pressure or irritate these spinal nerves. A test to actually look for nerve implications is going to be the straight leg test, which is going to indirectly pull on the nerve root, and then lateral flexion is going to compress the nerve and provoke both pain. So this will be covered in to your practical session too. A medial prolapse can cause damage to the cauda equina, depending on where this occurs. So Keep in mind that the conus medullaris, which is the termination of the spinal cord, occurs at lumbar vertebrae 1 and 2. So that means below L2 we have the cauda equina, which is going to be the horse's tail distribution of spinal nerves. And this means that if you have added pressure or compression or irritation onto the cauda equina, it can then lead to a whole bunch of more severe presentations or functional implications such as bladder or bowel incontinence for instance because many of these nerves are actually going to innovate the deep intrinsic structures um, of the pelvis, of reproductive organs, etc. So if we want to then visualize um, disc herniation due to its superior soft tissue resolution, MRI is going to be our modality of choice. CT is also useful, but it is typically regulated to use as a secondary study to better delineate any bony abnormalities. CT myelography can also be added when contraindications preclude the use of MRI and plain CT is inadequate to define the clinical problem. So I guess to summarize in terms of imaging and will be spoken about in the imaging um, video is when we're assessing trauma, typically the first point of call is going to be x-ray. When we're looking at degenerative conditions, prolapsed, slipped discs, or soft tissue injuries, MRI will be the modality that we resort to. So then I'm going to finish up this lecture by just looking at the basic anatomy of the major ligaments that support the vertebral column. And at the end of the segment, you should be able to describe the location as well as the function of major ligaments, as well as the most common ligaments to be torn and the reasons why. So ligaments of the spine are going to provide stability while allowing flexion, extension, and rotation. So there are six main ligamentous structures found throughout the vertebral column. So firstly, we have two ligaments that are going to attach directly to the vertebral bodies, and these are going to be our longitudinal ligaments. So there are two, and they are going to be named based on their location. So anteriorly, we have a relatively large, fairly thick in terms of the coverage ligament called the anterior longitudinal ligament. And its function is to limit hyperextension of the spine. It is also going to be responsible for maintaining the stability of the intervertebral discs. So very, very, very rarely do we actually see an IVD herniation occur anteriorly because you have this really wide coverage of the ligament spanning most of the anterior surface of the body. Posteriorly then, running straight in the midline, we have a narrow, almost string-like ligament, which is going to be the posterior longitudinal ligament, and its function is going to be the opposite. So it's going to resist hyperflexion of the spine, and it's also going to prevent posterior herniation of discs to an extent. Other ligaments, we have the supraspinous ligament, which is going to be attaching or coursing to the tip of the spinous processes of adjacent vertebrae. We then have interspinous ligaments, which are going to run between adjacent spinous processes. And then we have the ligamentum flavum, which is going to run along the length of the spinal canal, 
and it extends between adjacent laminar segments and defines the dorsolateral margins of the spinal canal. So the ligamentum flavum, when we're looking at a cross-section of the spinal cord, it is going to be the ligament that sits directly deep to the bony aspects of the lamina and the spinous process. So it helps in terms of maintaining the stability and the structure of that vertebral column pillar arrangement. And then in the neck, we have this expansion of the supraspinous ligament, which is called the ligamentum nuche. So it is going to be a fairly rigid, tough ligament only found in the C-spine, um, and it serves to limit cervical flexion. It is also going to maintain a constant disc load as well. And as I've mentioned, pain fibers are going to innervate all of the ligaments that are mentioned. So this means that any tears in the ligaments can also result in neck pain as well. If we then look at what are the common ligaments that are torn, if we look at a tear of the anterior longitudinal ligament, interspinous and the supraspinous tears, this is usually going to be consistent with a whiplash injury. So with whiplash, the head is going to be whipped backwards or in a hyper extended position relatively quickly upon impact. So this will initially tear the anterior longitudinal ligament and then usually the head is going to whip back fairly quickly in the opposite direction or is going to hyperflex. And accordingly, the supraspinous and the interspinous ligaments are going to become taut and then eventually tear. If we then look at posterior longitudinal ligament and ligamentum flavum, so sometimes thickening um, or ossification of these ligaments can then cause spinal stenosis, which is obviously going to um, irritate the nerve roots. And then lastly, if we look at a prolapsed intervertebral disc, this is going to bulge up against the posterior longitudinal ligament, um, which is going to disrupt the curvature or reference lines that we see in a C-spine radiograph.